Hey gang, in today's video I'll be showing you a very nice Geiger counter that you can make. This one here happens to be a dual tube unit. I'll also be showing you a low cost LCD Geiger counter, which you see right here, that you can purchase if you lack the skills required to make your own. Just like other items shown on my channel, you'll be saving money with your purchase by using the coupon code shown below the link to the item in the video description area. And you'll also be supporting my channel, which is absolutely necessary since ads placed on my videos do not fully compensate me for all my work. Geiger counters are extremely useful for testing rocks and other items for radioactivity or monitoring background radiation levels. If you live within 25 miles of a nuclear facility, then I would highly suggest you own a Geiger counter so you can closely monitor radiation levels in the event of an accident. Okay, let's take a look at the schematic. You're now looking at the schematic as shown at galacticelectronics.com. This schematic was drawn by John Quayley. I'm going to be placing a link to the website and John's schematic in the video description area. At that webpage, he also has an excellent explanation of how the circuit works. The schematic that's shown at that link is going to vary a little bit from the one that you see here. I made some modifications to this one so I can drive two tubes at the same time. I also added a yellow LED that blinks every time the speaker clicks. I also added a tally counter which counts up all the pulses as well. And I'm going to explain that to you right now in this schematic. You have the 9 volt battery. It comes right into this small audio transformer right here. So from this point here, you have a switch connected to the 9 volt battery. That is this switch right here. It turns on the unit. It goes into a green LED and a 1K resistor to the negative. So when the switch is turned on, you have an indication that power is on to the entire circuit. The audio transformer right here has an 8K secondary and a 1K primary that's center tapped and it is used backwards for this application. You're going to be putting pulses into the secondary which is a lower resistance and those pulses are going to create a higher voltage output on the 1K side. And this is what it looks like right here. You can see the blue, black and green on this side. That's the 1K side and you can see the white and the red on the 8 ohm side. You don't have to use the exact same transformer, but I do recommend using one very similar. Now the transistor that creates the pulses in the secondary to give you the higher voltage output on the primary side is going to be any of these transistors shown here, 2N2222, 2N4124, looks like a PN100, and it says PN2222. You can use other ones that are similar, you can refer to NTE's website if you'd like to cross-reference other transistors. On this side of the transformer, this is going to be stepped up to a higher voltage, probably between 70 and 90 volts. The black wire is a center tap, which goes 47K to ground, or battery negative. All the resistors shown here are going to be quarter watt. One wire, the blue, goes to the base of the transistor, and you can see the output at the top goes into this voltage multiplying circuit. Just a bunch of diodes and capacitors. Now if you want to know how these work much better, I do have a video that you can check out. It's very good. And you can click on the circle with the eye right over here and you'll see the drop down menu appear and you'll be able to click on that video. What I did because I'd like to have a higher voltage output is I did add one extra stage. This capacitor was not there this diode, that diode, and this capacitor here was not there. This part right here which goes to negative was right by this capacitor and that diode went straight down. It's a very good idea to add the extra stage to boost up the voltage if you're going to be using a Geiger Muller tube which operates at a higher voltage. Now because my circuit has two different tubes this used to be connected straight across into just one tube I now have the upper tube inside this unit. You can see right here it says detection area. There's a much smaller Geiger tube and that's designed for higher levels of radiation. 
and the one on the side is a much larger diameter tube designed for lower levels of radiation for higher sensitivity. So the one at the top with the 3 mega ohm anode resistor is the smaller tube and this one here going into the larger tube has a 1 mega ohm resistor. To learn which anode resistor you should use just refer to the data sheet for the Geiger Muller tube that you're using. From this point right over here this goes into the center of a switch, a single pole, double throw, and preferably a high voltage switch. When you put it in one position, it transfers the high voltage into one tube. When you switch it to the other position, it goes into the other tube. Both of the cathodes of the GM tubes are connected together before going to this 10K resistor. It's very important that the voltage range of these two tubes is very similar so you can have the switch go between both. You don't want to have a 400 volt tube and a 700. If you do, you'll have to have 700 coming off of here. And then when you switch it, you're going to have 700 into the tube that should only be getting 400 volts. If you do that, it's very likely that the gas inside the tube, rather than becoming charged, it can actually ionize or glow just like a neon lamp so you do not want to do that. If you're going to be using two Geiger Muller tubes that are a different voltage, say one is a 700 volt tube, one might be a 400, then the best thing for you to do, you would take the high voltage tap right at this point here, instead of going into a single pole double throw switch, you would go over here and use a double pole double throw switch, the high voltage tap would go over here, when the switch is lifted up, the high voltage would flow into the high voltage tube. When the switch is pushed to the lower position, what would happen, the high voltage tap would go over here, do absolutely nothing, while this one here would connect to the lower voltage tube. To get the voltage down, you would go over here. You can see this is the high voltage output, so you could probe right here, here, or here to get the voltage lower. In order to find out what the voltage is after the capacitor here, there, or there, you can't just take a digital multimeter, put it on DC volts for 750 volt range or 1000. It's not going to work because the input on a digital multimeter is usually 10 mega ohm, and the output current of this circuit is extremely low in the range of microamps. As soon as you connect the digital meter, to the circuit what's going to happen it's going to weigh the output voltage down so you're not going to see the true output voltage so if it's really 750 volts at this point it may only show 450 volts the way around that is you're going to take a 200 mega ohm resistor like you see right here you're going to connect this in series with the red probe of your digital multimeter and you're going to set it on a lower range when you do that, you'll then be able to probe after each one of these capacitors and you're going to get a voltage reading. When you get that much lower voltage reading, you're going to multiply it by 20 and that's going to be roughly what the voltage output is at each one of those locations. Each one of these capacitors right here is a 0 0.033 200 volt nonpolar. And each one of these diodes used in the multiplier circuit is a 1N4935, which is a fast switching diode. Now in order to adjust the output voltage at this point right here, you're going to be using this potentiometer. This is a 50K. If you add the extra multiplying stage like I did, then I highly suggest you make that a 100K. You can probe this point right here using the 200 mega ohm resistor in series with the red probe of your digital multimeter and you'll be able to adjust that output voltage. Over here is the red LED. This is used to indicate when the 9 volt battery is getting low. You have an LM358. This is an op amp. I decided to use a low noise TL072 instead. Over here you have a voltage divider 100K and a 24. When it's connected across a 9 volt battery you're going to have around 1.8 volts going in. Over here is a voltage reference, 1.2 volts. It's an LM385Z. If you don't have one, you can make a voltage reference by using an LM317T like you see right here. 9 volt in, you have your adjust, 
between the adjust and the out is a 200 ohm resistor and that should give you a 1.25 volt output right over here. Take that 1.25 volt output and you would connect it right over here. Now I want to explain how a Geiger Muller tube works which is named after the two people that designed the tube back in the 1920s. Inside this tube is a very low pressure gas which is an inert gas usually helium, neon, or argon. The anode goes into the center of that tube and the high voltage puts a charge on the gas inside the tube. When an incoming energetic particle strikes the tube or a ray, it causes the low pressure inert gas inside the tube to ionize. Each time that event occurs, the Geiger counter will click or in my case also give a visual indication. When that ionization occurs, the pulse is going to be sent into the base of this transistor, which is going to amplify that pulse and send it into this 555 one-shot configuration. Every time a pulse is detected, the 555 timer will send out a brief pulse. This is an ordinary 555 timer, it's not a CMOS, and over here I have point A, I'll explain that in a minute. This is a 10 ohm resistor. This is a 47 microfarad 25 volt electrolytic capacitor which used to go into a speaker but I decided to eliminate the speaker to save space and use a piezo buzzer rated 6 to 18 volts. It works extremely well. Over here on pin 7 I took a 104 nonpolar capacitor which is 0.1 microfarad, tapped into pin 7, and went into a yellow LED. The anode, the cathode, goes to a 470 to 510 ohm resistor to the battery negative. Across the battery is a 330 microfarad, 25 volt electrolytic capacitor. All the other values are clearly shown at the link shown in the video description area. Now in order to have the pulses counted, I purchased a tally counter on eBay. It was very inexpensive. This one right here. And what I did is I bypassed this main switch and I took the switch contacts and connected it to a PC123 optocoupler. The side of the switch which was positive, I tested each pad of the switch between battery negative and each one of the switch contacts. I took the positive side of the switch connected it to the collector of the internal transistor of the optocoupler and then this side here went to the negative side of the switch. I decided to use a PC123 but for best results you want to use one that has a very fast recovery. There are fast optocouplers available. You could look online for faster ones if you desire a more accurate count. Over here is point A, and that's where I tapped the optocoupler into the circuit to connect to my tally counter. From point A, I went into a 200 to a 220 ohm resistor. You're going to drive the internal LED a little higher than normal, and that's going to ensure that fewer counts are missed. And the dot on the optocoupler is where the 200 to 220 ohm resistor will be connected. The other side goes to battery negative. And that's the entire circuit that was used for my dual tube Geiger counter. Now we're going to take a closer look at the unit. Okay, this is the unit. The tube you see here is a Russian made tube. The smaller tube on the inside is a US made tube. I'll be showing you the one on the inside in a minute when I open up the unit. When the switch is in the up position like you see here, it's for higher sensitivity, which means this tube is on. When I push it to the lower setting like that, the internal tube is now powered up for areas of higher radiation. Over here is the LED which goes on red when the battery starts to get low. This is the tally counter. It will go on automatically or I can push this button right here. And then when the unit starts counting you will see it register. Each click is shown right here visually, yellow LED, and there is the piezo buzzer. Here's the power indicator, and this is the on-off switch. 
This shows the detection area of the internal tube. Now before I open up this unit to show you the inside, I just want to mention one more thing. These tubes here are designed for beta, gamma, and x-ray detection. And those are the more dangerous types of radiation. Alpha particles are much larger than beta particles, and they move a lot slower. If you wanted to detect alpha, then you would have to have a tube that has a mica window, usually on the very end. This is what mica looks like. This is a mica washer. And the window is usually only a few microns thick, maybe five to eight microns thick. And I can pull a layer off here to show you. That's a thin sheet. You would have a window of mica like that, and it would allow alpha particles to pass to be detected. If there was an alpha source right here, you can hold a sheet of paper between the source and the tube, and the detection would stop. What I'd like to do now is show you how to use this 200 mega ohm resistor when measuring voltage. Okay, let me take a reading of this 9 volt battery. And it's around 968. And now what I'm going to do is use the 200 mega ohm resistor in series with the positive. Let me put this on a lower range of 2 volts. So it's around 0.475 volts. And if you multiply that by 20, you end up with around 9.5 volts. Now keep in mind, it's not going to be exact because the value of this resistor could be a hair under 200 or a hair over 200 mega ohm, but it will allow you to measure high voltage coming off the Geiger counter circuit with no problem at all. This is what it looks like with the cover off right over here is the piezo buzzer, 3 to 20 volt, Radio Shack 273059. This is where all the clicking is going to be coming from when the radiation is detected. Over here is the optocoupler, which is tied into the tally counter on the back side of this cover. I added this little desiccant bag to keep things nice and dry on the inside. This is the LED. That will flash each time there's a pulse detected at the same time that you hear the click. Let's take a look inside now. Here's the 9 volt battery. I got the on off switch. Now this is the other tube way down here at the bottom. You see the silver and the black? You can see the anode resistor, 3 mega ohm going in. You can see the high voltage multiplier circuit, all the diodes and capacitors here. In the back you have the 555 and the TL072, both of those have sockets. Right over here is the LM317T, and then you can see the transformer. This housing was perfect for me, and I picked it up at Radio Shack as well. Over here is the switch to go between the two tubes, and I glued the smaller GM tube into the plastic housing using silicone. They put the lid back on and powered up. To get started, I'm going to turn on the unit and we're just going to monitor the background radiation. Once that gets going, I'm going to show you a sample right here. These are uranium glass beads. Not super radioactive, but they are radioactive enough that you're going to see the count speed up. I also have a mantle for a gas lantern right here. It's made of thorium and this has a very good level of radioactivity. So let's get started, let's power it up. Right there, yep, you see it flashing. Keep in mind, sometimes I see this flash as I'm looking at the camera, but it's not showing up in the camera, so it must be the frame rate, but it is flashing on every click. And we're up to 19, 20, 21. Now I'm going to take the uranium beads and place it right next to the tube. Here we go.
Now the count's very accurate unless the source of radiation is very hot, then it may miss a few counts, which is why you want to look for a optocoupler which has a very fast response and it has a short delay to recover. It'll avoid missing counts. So now we're back to the normal radiation being counted, the background. Now watch this thorium mantle. This thing really goes fast. Here we go. Now on sources like this that are pretty hot, what I would do is I'd push the switch down to low. Alright, now I'm using this tube. Now we're going to reset it. Now we're on the smaller tube. This one will do nothing. And you're just getting background clicks, usually around five or six in a minute. Let me hold this right where the tube is. Keep in mind, the plastic will block a little bit of the beta. The plastic's not that thick, so the beta will still pass with the gamma. As you can see, it's counting good. All right, now let me add the beads to it. Put everything right there. The good thing is, if I have this in an area where the radiation is high and it's causing the count to go really fast with this tube, I can switch to the smaller tube because there is a lot of radiation and the count will move along slower. But the only bad thing is, if this is moving along at a good clip on this tube, you should definitely not be in that area. Okay, let me show you the other Geiger counter now. This is the Geiger counter that has the link placed in the video description area. It works extremely well and it is very reasonably priced. Okay, to power up the unit you have your membrane switches, push the on button. This is going to register the radiation right here. This line in the center, after seven minutes of graphing the radiation level at the bottom, it's going to give you the average dose. Now keep in mind this could be powered using a micro USB or double-A batteries. The back is open to let the radiation in a lot easier. You can see the tube has a little bit, a little bit of a iridescent look. I'll open it and show you in a minute. You can see the background radiation goes between 0 and around 0 0.6. This is the normal range. When you get towards 0 0.5, 0 0.6, it's actually high. So you want to keep an eye on that. You can monitor the radiation level over seven minutes time. Once the seven minutes passes, you'll have that average dose. You can record it, and then you can push this button right here. It looks like a play button once more, and it'll do another seven-minute monitoring session and give you the average dose again. You could do it as many times as you would like. The unit will measure all the way up to 100 microsieverts. Now, you're never going to want to be in an area that is 100 microsieverts. It would be a high danger area and it could put you at risk for radiation sickness. Anything above 5 microsieverts is actually an area you would not want to be in for any prolonged period of time. Right over here, you can see it's trending up slightly. Keep in mind it only goes between 0 and 0.6 on this little graph at the bottom. It's only intended to measure changes in background radiation. 
Once you get above 0.6, it's going to flatline at the top. Now if you want to set an alarm, what you could do, right over here it's very hard to see with the lighting, but there's a bar with little dots. It looks like radiation striking the tube. When it's on that setting, you're going to hear every single click. If I push that button once, speaker's now off. The clicks won't be heard anymore. If I push this button, you can see the speaker with the three lines like here. You could set it for 0.5, 1, 2, or 5 microsieverts as an alarm. So if the level exceeds 5 microsieverts, it's going to sound the alarm. So let me put it back down to 2. All right. And what I'm going to do now is bring the uranium beads very close to the tube. Now the tube is on this side right here. Here we go. Speaker's off, so let me put the speaker back on. There you go. And you can see the radiation level spiking up over here. And as you can see, the beads are not super radioactive. I think it tops out around 0.8, but let me switch now. It'll come back down in a minute. It'll start to drop back. Now if I take the thorium mantle, watch this. Once it exceeds 2, you'll hear the alarm. Oop, when I push this button only. There you go. The alarm will go on when it exceeds 2. Fold it in half, make it a little thicker in that area. There you go. All right. And then it goes back off when it goes under. So you can set it at those different ranges like I said. And over here I'm going to let it go to the end and show you what the average dose would have been including the background radiation with the beads as well as the thorium mantle. So let's let it run a little bit more. It's almost ready to show you. the. There it is. So we averaged 0.45 microsieverts an hour. So what you would do is you'd write that down, and that's your average exposure for the seven minutes. I can push this button again, and it's going to start a brand new count. And that's it. It's extremely simple to use, and it works very well. Let's take a look at the back. I'll open it up. And this is a peek at the inside. Sound comes out of here. Got a microprocessor. This cable goes over to the membrane switch over here. LCD is connected from the back side of this board and over here you have your tube. Now I'm going to show you on this Geiger counter that when you try measuring the voltage it's going to come out very very low. Take a look right here. 187 volts. Now this tube is a 4 to 500 volt tube so as you can see at 187, you're going to think that this tube is not getting enough voltage. So now we're going to go to a auto range. We push this to auto. 
there we go, DC Auto. Now I'm going to take the 200 meg resistor, place it on the anode, and then this to the battery, and let's see what the voltage is. Whatever that voltage is, you're going to multiply it by 20. Here we go. There you go. So 20 times 20 is 400, so it's right around 420 volts, and that's exactly what the voltage of that tube operates at, between 380 and 450. I hope you enjoyed this video. If you did, please rate it a thumbs up, subscribe, and post links to this video on other websites and blogs. Also be sure to check out my video playlist as well. Thank you very much for watching.